this. Protesters are demanding a merit-based system to replace the current allegations. This is the latest world news from the BBC. The Islamic State protest did carry out Monday's attack on a mosque in Oman that killed six people and wounded nearly 30. The Sunni Muslim attack on the Shiite mosque took place on a Shunna, the day on which Shia Muslims commemorate one of their first imams. The exiled Chinese businessman Wu Wenguei has been convicted by a U.S. court of stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from online followers. Federal prosecutors said Paul had raised more than a billion dollars by guaranteeing that backers would not lose money in a series of investment and cryptocurrency schemes. He promised that some of the profits would be used to attack the Chinese government. Instead, the money was used to fund a lavish lifestyle. Elon Musk says he's moving the headquarters of his social media and space companies from California to Texas because of the new law on gender identity. He called it the last straw. Saranjana Tawari has more details. The law forbids school districts from requiring teachers to look like a Issue with 
Mr. Trump's previous reference to so-called black jobs, saying, I know what a black job is. It's Vice President of the United States, a reference, of course, to the choice of Kamala Harris as his running mate. Well, that led to a standing ovation, not to the first part of the night, and calls from the crowd and that for four more years from the job. Well, he repeated his call, David, for the temperature to be lowered, but he was very much on the attack nonetheless against his rival, citing gun control and abortion issues. Is this, do you think, something of a return to normal politics uh, between Democrats and Republicans? Well, there lies the dilemma for Joe Biden, and it's a frustration that he has publicly acknowledged for how to roll back the acrimonious political rhetoric whilst at the same time continuing to portray Donald Trump as a threat to democracy, something that uh, Joe Biden fervently believes his rival to be. It's a tough legal to thread, and Mr. Biden made the point that despite the calls for greater civility for Saturday's assassination attempt, he wasn't going to stop telling the truth. Well, Donald Trump has said that he has decided to rewrite the speech that he's due to give to the RNC conference on Thursday night in order to water it down somewhat to make it less aggressive and really we'll have to wait and see I think to what extent it does that and what impact if any it has on the campaign going forward. Um, just briefly David, uh, Donald Trump's uh, also given an interview to Bloomberg Business News. That's right, uh, an interview conducted last month and in it he refuted suggestions that, did, that he might look to replace Jerome Powell as chair of the US Federal Reserve despite the fact that the two men have clashed over their interest rate policy in the past. And he revealed that the chief executive of the Wall Street investment bank JP Morgan, a man by the name of Jamie Dimon, was being considered for the role of Treasury Secretary in the future Donald Trump White House. David Willis, thank you very much. Staying in the US, one of the most influential Democratic senators, Bob Menendez, has been found guilty of corruption at the end of the trial in New York. He was convicted on all charges, including bribery, acting as a foreign agent, and obstructing justice. A correspondent in Washington, Naomi Wells, has more. The accusation that he's now been found guilty of is that he accepted gifts, including gold bars worth $100,000, but also cash in the Mercedes Benz, in exchange for illegally aiding foreign governments. Specifically, that he accepted these gifts from businessmen acting on behalf of the Egyptian government. Now, he has continued to strongly deny the allegations, even after that verdict was delivered, saying that he has never, ever acted as a foreign agent and that he is deeply disappointed by this result, suggesting that he is likely to appeal. His defense throughout this case centered on his argument that these were not bribes because the prosecution couldn't prove that any direct actions had been taken as a result of the gifts that he had received. But this is certainly a very damning verdict for Mr. Menendez. Now, he is trying to stand as an independent candidate to regain his seat in November's election after many Democrats distanced themselves from him and cut ties from him. But today, he is facing multiple calls from senior Democrats to stand down for what is becoming the latest headache of the Democrat party. Hey, Once upon a time, the tech billionaire Elon Musk said that he prefers a village of politics. However, just the information about a child's gender identity, including to their parents. Well, the newsroom's Ella Bickle joins me in the studio. Ella, California's first U.S. state passed this kind of legislation today. Yes, Bernadette, California is often to more than that of the United States. The 
Speak of the Office says this bill keeps children safe from preventing politicians and school staff from inappropriately intervening in family matters. But others, including Elon Musk, for example, argue that it stops parents from knowing what's happening with their children, which they say is their parental needs. So what's all this got to do with him in the California for Texas? Well, it was on X that he uh, called this bill um, a final straw and that in his view it will cause massive destruction of parental rights and put children at risk of permanent damage. And because of that, SpaceX, which is his rocket manufacturing company, then will be the focus on California to some base in Texas. And also his social media platform X will be moved from San Francisco to the city of Austin, also in Texas. And when it comes to LGBTQ issues, Elon Musk's daughter is transgender. And he says he supports trans issues, but he has been criticised by LGBTQ groups in the past for not being pronouns. In one tweet, he called them an aesthetic nightmare. If this kind of thing exists and he does go ahead, it will certainly be the strongest stance we've ever seen him take on this topic. SpaceX employs 5,000 people across the state. It's got a major tech company like X out of the powerhouse, which is Silicon Valley. It's no small feat. However, Bernadette Musk has had a long love-hate relationship with California. For years now, he's been at loggerheads with the state government over numerous issues, largely in regulation. COVID-19 restrictions were part of his reason why he moved Tesla's headquarters to Austin in 2021. And also Elon Musk mainly resides in Texas, which in California has no impact. And what else do we know about Elon Musk's politics? Well, um, it was on Saturday, shortly after Donald Trump, uh, Trump's assassination attempt, that Elon Musk took to Twitter. Um, he denounced it, but he also said that he um, was fully endorsing Donald Trump, which, which is really interesting because um, usually Elon Musk hasn't really had a strict, uh, he's never strictly aligned himself to one party. He's made donations to both Democratic and Republican candidates over the years, including Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. And now Donald Trump, um, for example, the Wall Street Journal, we've seen reports from them that he plans to donate $45 million to Trump's campaign every month to a man in the election in November. Ella Bickle, thank you. You're listening to the newsroom from the BBC World Service. Our main news, President Biden is back on the campaign trail, calling for a ban on the type of gun used in the failed assassination attempt of Donald Trump. It also warned that politics in the US has become too heated. More than 40 people were reported to have been killed in airstrikes in Gaza on Tuesday, including 17 in a designated safe zone. Israel says it was attacking Hamas fighters who hid among civilians. Since the massacre of 1,200 people in Israel on the 7th of October, more than 38,000 Palestinians have died in Gaza due to the Hamas-run health ministry. Our special correspondent, Fergal Keane, reports now on one of those deaths, a young man with Down syndrome who lived in the embattled district of Shujaya. And a warning, parts of Fergal's report are distressing. <laughs> Square, but then there would be bombing. We would go to Shawa Square, 
but there would also be bombing. So I feel that it is coming somewhere. Some of the troops searching houses in Gaza. They move carefully, fearful of ambush. Often dogs are sent ahead into rooms and tunnels. Like this German shepherd attacking a Hamas fighter last December. <laughs> in the army raided Mohammed's house on July 3rd, his family says a dog immediately attacked the disabled young man. I constantly see the dog tearing at him and his camp and the blood pouring from him. This scene I would never forget. It stays in front of my eyes the whole time. It never leaves me. We couldn't save them, neither from the dog nor from them. Two brothers were arrested. The wounded Muhammad was taken into another room. He was given some medical care, though it's not clear what. Nabila Bahar says the troops eventually told the family to leave the building. I asked them to let me take Muhammad with me. How could I leave him alone? Who would take care of him? They told me Muhammad is gone. I asked what does God mean? Is he dead? They did not respond and they told us all to get out. About a week later the family was able to return. You're hearing the voice of Jibreel Bahar as he shows a BBC colleague a video of his brother Muhammad lying dead on the floor. There's a tourniquet on his arm. Gauze used to try and stop bleeding from a wound. Muhammad came in, left him on his head. Muhammad was lying here with his hand restrained with plastic and gauze. They were trying to stop the bleeding. Then they left him without stitches or care, just these basic first aid measures. Let's go and take the first aid. There was no autopsy and no certificate of death, no medical conclusion as to what exactly caused the death. In response to our queries, the Israel Defense Forces said they were checking on the report. Muhammad was buried in an alley between houses because it was too dangerous to take the corpse to a mortuary or a graveyard. Fergal Keane reporting, and we're still awaiting a response from the Israeli army to the BBC's request for comment. In the face of a struggling economy, Thailand has unveiled a plan to give 50 million people around $250 each in the hope of stimulating growth. The country, which is reliant on tourism, is also expanding its visa schemes. This report from Stephanie Zachrison. The stimulus plan was the ruling through Thai Party's flagship policy that it promised its voters in the 2023 general election. Around 50 million people are estimated to be eligible for the scheme, in which they'd be given 10,000 bucks to spend locally within six months. Lower income ties over the age of 16 will be able to apply, with a payout expected towards the end of the year. The government estimates the total cost to be $13.8 billion, but insists the high cost will inject a much needed boost into Southeast Asia's second largest economy. The country has been lagging behind regional peers in growth, and in the last year, nearly 2,000 factories have closed, upending its manufacturing sector that contributes nearly a quarter of its GDP. And tourism, a key pillar of the Thai economy, has still not fully recovered from the pandemic. On the usually bustling Khao Road in the capital, Bangkok, Polo Art Laulet runs a food store where he sells pad thai and spring rolls. I think it's worse than COVID. After the pandemic, the tourism came back a little bit, then it dropped. Now it's very poor, very poor. I want the government to have lots of activity. They need to do any activity so that the tourists come. It's very quiet. Tourism revenue during the first six months of 2024 came in at 858 billion baht, or 23.6 billion dollars, still less than a quarter of the government's target. Now, Thailand is also expanding its visa-free entry scheme to 93 countries and territories. Previously, the rules allowed passport holders from 57 nations to enter without a visa, allowing them to stay in Thailand for up to 60 days. The government is also allowing students to stay after finishing their degree, introducing a new visa for remote workers, 
and it can scrap to propose tourism fee for visitors flying into the country in its attempts to revitalise the crucial tourism industry. Stephanie Zafferson. Paris is counting down to the start of next week's Olympics with more than 10,000 athletes competing in 32 sports. There's been controversy about who will represent Afghanistan. When the Taliban returned to power, women lost many of their rights, including access to sport. There have been calls for Afghanistan to be banned from the Games, but a compromise was found with a gender equal team of three men and three women allowed to compete. The World Services' Farouz Rahimi met two of the women at their training camp in Switzerland. In the shadow of the looming Swiss Alps, Yunus and Reba Hashimi dig deep and pedal even harder to hurl their bikes through the drizzling rain. We are in the car and following the sisters. They are going through their rigorous training program despite the rainy conditions. The two women are part of a special team representing Afghanistan at the Paris Olympics. It is the culmination of both a long and difficult personal journey and political wrangles over whether the country would be allowed to compete at the games following the Taliban's takeover. I met them at their training base at the World Cycling Center near the town of Ayur. Yulduz told me how pleased they were to be heading to the games. Me and my sister, we are so happy. We support each other. We are doing all races, all training together. Training at the state-of-the-art facility in Switzerland is very different from where they grew up in Faria, a remote and conservative province in northern Afghanistan. There, the sisters taught themselves to cycle and had to wear disguises when competing in their first races. They dreamed of one day competing at the Olympics even as people angry at seeing women riding bicycles through stones at them. In 2021, when the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan, they placed huge restrictions on women's rights. Fearing for their future, the sisters used their contacts in the cycling community to flee the country. Fariba told me how much going to Paris 2024 will mean to them in the light of their country's recent troubled history. When you go to Olympics, would you be thinking about Afghan women? Of course, I was not speak about Afghan women. The situation is now is schizophrenia in Afghanistan and everything is good for the women. I hope they will open everything for the women. Fazl Ahmad Fazli, the president of the Afghan Cycling Federation, who like the sisters now lives in Switzerland, helped to negotiate their place at the Games. We are the people which never give up and we keep on striving just to make this possible. There was uh, many discussions, there was many requests and the day when we had this uh, confirmation, at the actual I was just, I cannot describe like how happy I was and how excited I was. The decision to send the team ended months of uncertainty over whether the Taliban would be allowed to send a male-only team to the Games. The International Olympic Committee now say no Taliban officials will be allowed at the Paris Olympics. For Fariba, taking part in the Games will fulfill a lifelong ambition. Olympic for me, it was a dream for when I'm trying. I'm come from Afghanistan. I'm trying my best one for everyone, and especially for women in Afghanistan in Afghanistan. Certainly, it hasn't been easy for Yulduz and Fariba to achieve their dreams, especially living far from home. Despite the challenges that lie ahead, they are determined to make their presence felt at the Olympics in front of the world. For them, this is about far more than just sport. Peru's Rahimi in Switzerland. But it's not only Afghanistan that's proved a challenge for the Olympic organisers. For months, the press has been reporting horror stories about the substandard quality of the water in the Seine, the main river running through Paris. In the next few hours, the city's mayor, Anne Hidalgo, will don her swimming costume and take to the river in an effort to convince everyone that the Seine is clean enough for some swimming events. Hugh Schofield reports. It's been touch and go, but finally the Olympics organisers are confident that water quality in the Seine will be all right for the competition. Several times in recent weeks the news has been bad, as successive tests showed the amount of bacteria in the river to be above accepted norms. That was mainly because of high rainfall, which tends to mean more human effluent ending up in the river. But now, summer weather has finally arrived and the latest water quality readings have been positive. 
So, fulfilling a promise, the Mayor and Hidalgo is to take the plunge this morning, accompanied by the Chairman of the Olympics Organising Committee, Tony Estangay, and possibly by some journalists too. Hugh Schofield, who's also planning to take the plunge in the Seine. You've been listening to the newsroom from the BBC World Service with me, Bernadette Keogh. Remember, you can download our global news podcasts for stories from around the world. This is the BBC World Service, where Copper Bullets continues. The plane which was carrying the Zambian national soccer team has crashed into the Atlantic Ocean and they are not surviving us. It was terrible. That team was going to fall back. In episode two, Zambia is trying to make sense of the disaster that took the lives of their national football team. Where do we go from here? Nobody had an answer. Nobody could say. Questions are being asked about how it could have happened. The worst part is we haven't been told what really transpired on that really flight. And concerns about the safety of the aircraft are coming to light. The Buffalo DHC-5 plane was an Air Force plane and previously it had crashed on Air Force duty. And yet the national team continued to travel to Buffalo. Amazing sports stories, copper bullets. Saturday at 17.30 GMT or listen to the whole series now wherever you get your BBC podcasts. As we heat up the world's atmosphere, there's more chance of intense rainfall, which can lead to more flooding. There's an even bigger problem. When those floods hit informal settlements, it can be disastrous, as we often don't know much about them. Nobody made a plan of where a house would be, which means that we have no idea what's out there. So this week, we're asking, can technology help us fight flooding in cities? Answers in the climate question, after the BBC World Service News. BBC News with Neil Nunes. President Biden has called for the type of rifle used in the failed assassination attempt on Donald Trump to be banned as he returned to the campaign trail for the first time since Saturday's attack. Speaking in Las Vegas, Mr. Biden said he was thankful Mr. Trump had not been badly injured, but also criticized his opponent on a number of issues. Meanwhile, U.S. security officials say protection for Mr. Trump was increased several weeks ago after the authorities learned of an Iranian plot to kill him. But they stressed there is no known connection between Iran and Saturday's attack. American Democratic Senator Bob Melendez is facing a lengthy prison sentence after being convicted of 16 charges, including bribery and influence handling, says he appealed. The headquarters of Bangladesh's main opposition party has been raided by police. It follows a novel day of violent protests against a quota system for government jobs. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for Monday's attack in a mosque in Oman. Six people were killed. The exiled Chinese businessman Guo Wenhui has been convicted by a U.S. court of stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from online followers. He used the money to fund a lavish lifestyle. An Australian computer scientist who falsely claims to have been the creator of the Bitcoin cryptocurrency is facing a criminal investigation in Britain after he was found to have repeatedly lied to support his claim. Craig Wright used was sued by a coalition of cryptocurrency businesses. And Elon Musk says he's moving the headquarters of his social media and space companies from California to Texas because of a new law on gender identity. Mr. Musk said that families and companies were coming under attack from California's government. NBC News. Imagine you hearing the voice of the night. A pipe is burst, but it keeps getting closer. Blowing water louder and louder. Now imagine you live next to a river and hear that noise. Sleeping in a house built from wood and corrugated iron. You're on the ground floor, and no one from the authorities know you live here if you need to get help. That must be absolutely terrifying. As more and more people move to cities, more and more informal settlements are built. Nobody made a plan of where a house would be, which means that we have no idea what's out there. And as we heat up the world's atmosphere, there's more chance of intense rainfall, which can lead to flooding in cities. There's an even bigger problem. 
we're often in the dark when it comes to these unplanned places. How many people live there, what the buildings are made of, or if they're built next to rivers or lakes. But new technology can help us shed some light. These drones are used to pioneer flood defense mechanisms, also helping emergency services officials. I'm Jordan Dunbar, and this week in the Climate Question from the BBC World Service, we're asking, how can we use technology to fight flooding in cities? When the rains started falling in Rio Grande do Sol, Brazil, back in May, people didn't immediately think it was that strange. This is one of the rainiest parts of the country, after all. But this rain just wouldn't stop day after day, and it was heavy, really heavy. So heavy that scientists are linking these multi-day deluges to climate change. They think it can double the chance of them happening again in the biggest city in southern Brazil. Porto Alegre is the capital of the Rio Grande do Sul state. We have borders with Uruguay and Argentina here, and it's a city of one and a half million inhabitants. Rodrigo Hoca is an architect working with the Responsive Cities Institute, who are based in Porto Alegre in Brazil. It's actually quite a big city. In my terms, it's a beautiful city. We have five rivers, and all of these five rivers, they end in the Guaíba River here in Porto Alegre. So it starts raining, and it's like two or three days after Porto Alegre became flooded. And for safety measures, the energy company of the city turned off all this neighborhood, no electricity for 23 days. After a week of storms and heavy rain, at least half a million people are without power and clean water. We have nowhere to sleep and nothing to eat. We have nothing. And the very young believe that the water is it's got to debris and it's dangerous, right? Yeah, it's very dangerous. And actually, we saw crocodiles in the city center. Wow. And because there wasn't energy at night, it was very dangerous because all the city center, all the empty apartments started to get rocked. I got worried when I noticed that it was very hard to leave the city because almost all the roads that lead to the city were blocked by the water. We have only one road and all the airport was damaged. We were kind of trapped because there was only one exit. Okay, so it's stressful, it's scary, but the trigger you decided to take action, right? So the first thing we did was we noticed that a lot of volunteers were starting to organize all the data from the flooding. A lot of shelters got built. We didn't know how many people was in each shelter, what the shelter need for food, for clothing, for mattress. We didn't know that. So the first thing we did as an institute, we tried to centralize this data. We saw each shelter in the map. And we can see if this shelter needs food, if this shelter needs mattress, we can see everything like that. And it starts to get very useful for not only the people, but the municipality too. Rodrigo and his colleagues at the architecture firm gave up their normal work and concentrated on this mapping. When he says data, he means crucial information. Information that could save lives in the aftermath of the floods. Responsive cities created a digital map with all this vital information about the city in one place for the first time. We start adding some layers in this map. The first layer was the flood area, and then we cross-reference this layer with the layer of homes that we have from like the government. We saw that we had 400,000 homes in the flooding area. So they're in danger? They're in danger. So we start putting shelters in the map, put if the shelter is needing some food, some water, and all the volunteers that are trying to donate stuff could see in the map where they need to go to donate specific items. 
one part of the city was hit harder than the others. The water would just going up and then stay up for, I think, 20 days and then go down, right? And this destroyed a lot of homes, especially the informal urban settlements. It's very difficult to map because we didn't know how many people were living there before the destruction. Across the Atlantic in the Netherlands, Dr. Caroline Kivert is going beyond maps. Her work at the University of Twente and the World Bank is looking at how new technology like drones, satellites and artificial intelligence can help prevent and respond to floods like these. And once again, it's all about information. But I wanted to know, why don't cities have this data already? So it depends a bit where you are. This can be because of the resources that the country has. So you see more often in low to middle income countries that there's less of this information available. And also in those countries, another problem is that they're changing so quickly. So a lot of the cities that are growing the fastest are in these countries that have less resources. And because of that, it's also more difficult to have up-to-date information about where the buildings are and which assets may be flooded. I want to turn now to informal settlements. What exactly are they and why are they growing rapidly in cities around the world? So informal settlements are sometimes known as slums or deprived areas or uh, there are many different terms, but essentially it's the neighborhoods of the cities that are not officially registered, that's why they're called informal. And they often tend to have worse building materials, so they're not constructed according to the building codes. The buildings are very small, close together. Uh, think of like favelas or shanty towns, or many different names for these types of neighborhoods. And why are they in particular vulnerable to flooding? So these informal areas by nature are growing in areas where the city has not planned for buildings to be. So this is often hazardous areas. So you'll often find that informal settlements, as we may call them, are actually located, for example, close to rivers that might be flooded. So the amount of damage will be different because simply the shacks themselves are not very sturdy constructions. Roads turned into rivers and tens of thousands of people forced to flee their homes. Now when I'm being rescued, I feel relieved. But it's terrifying because we saw the water rise in an absurd way. It rose at a very high speed. There's a real lack of information around these communities. Who lives there, how close they are to rivers, if they can withstand flooding. But in the past, getting that crucial information was expensive and time consuming. It has really been a game changer the amount of satellite imagery that's available. So then by having regular updates of satellite imagery, we can look at how the cities are growing and we can see the changes as they're happening. The problem is that these satellite images are a bit more blurry, so you can see a building, but you can't really see finer details. So then when we look at drones, drones are useful because what happens is the detail that we get out of the imagery is much higher. Drones are small remote controlled flying devices that can carry cameras. They've been a real game changer for aerial photography before we had to rely on helicopters for the same thing, which are really expensive. So you can start to see fences, you can start to see details that are important, like sandbags, for example. So what we saw was really, really helpful when using drones for mapping these informal areas. They said, imagine if you're a flood planner and you need to work to develop a flood plan for informal settlement. They are informal. Nobody made a plan of where a house would be, which means that you have no idea what's out there. So it's essentially uh, speeding up the process of getting information. We can get more information that we didn't have before. And all of this is changing the different types of technology. Types of technology like artificial intelligence or computer software that enables computers to think for themselves. AI can spot patterns, solve problems, and make decisions much faster than humans can. So what we use AI a lot for is to make our processes more automatic. So the way that we would traditionally do it is imagine we get a drone image, which means you get an entire city, and then we're going to go on top and you're kind of going to mark every building. So you're kind of drawing on top of the image and saying building one, building two, and it takes a lot of time. And so what we do with AI, which is instead of me or you or lots of people sitting there and actually digitizing or drawing out every building to make the map, we give it to an AI model that you're going to do this automatically. So in theory, it speeds up the process of making maps a lot. 
And when you say AI model, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. In my head, it's easier to think this is a computer program you can feed maps into, which will find buildings, which will give you information, pull information together, meaning a human doesn't need to do. Yeah, it's making processes automatic. So instead of, and in this case, you'll be giving it the image, not the map. So you just give it the image directly and we'll make a map of a map. Let's say that's what we try to get to with the AI model. There are all sorts of ways AI could help us respond to the changing climate. You can check out another show we made on this topic. Can artificial intelligence help farmers adapt to the effects of climate change wherever you get your podcasts? With flooding, we can witness AI at work on the ground in South Africa. There's a project using drones and AI to try and prevent flooding in a township or informal settlement in Johannesburg. We sent Namsa Maseko, the BBC Southern Africa correspondent, to see a demonstration of South Africa flag. So Alexander is quite a well-known township. It's one of the oldest, actually, in the country as well. It was established around uh, 1912, and it's a very small region that is home to about a million people. So it's small but very congested, and it is mainly made up of informal settlements you know, shacks which are made out of corrugated iron sheets and most of these homes were developed on the banks of the Yatske River. You've been there, haven't you? You've been in Alex when there have been floods. Do you remember reporting on them? Yes. Over the years in my days as a local news reporter, I think on more than 10 occasions I visited Alexander Township when it was flooding. <laughs> After a severe drought in the region, the heavens have finally opened, but with devastating effects. And those that live here on the banks of the Yatske River have been the hardest hit. My home was swept away with the heavy rains. I couldn't even say anything. The only thing I have, I'm a I have been, you know, above ground on the chopper with police and rescue officials watching homes being washed away and, and people drowning and people in Alex have been warned so many times over the years not to build their homes along the riverbanks. People will be wondering, if it keeps flooding, why are people building their houses on the riverbanks and all Because there's nowhere else for them to go. Alexandra is literally right opposite Africa's richest square mile and that's where people get jobs. Alexandra is one of the poorest townships in the country, but people want to live close to an area where they work or where they can find jobs. And I went to speak to people there. Two years ago, there were half of these shacks. Now there's a triple actually from 2022. So you can imagine the risk that these people are facing today if they ever had to be flat. So, we are now looking at where the river is. Yes. Because it runs along this road. Yes. And people have built wide front backs. Yes. 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 How dangerous is that? That's extremely dangerous because history does tell us that before houses were falling into the river, right? Children were drowning and were dying. And as they go in one more towards the bank, the risk increases. actually good for me for the first time in my life to go to Alexandra 
when there is no disaster to go and report on. This is definitely you know, one of those great positive news stories that I actually looked forward to covering as soon as I heard about this project. Even the people that were there and watching the demonstrations of you know, the drone technology and artificial intelligence, people were really pleased because you know, they're thinking that it's definitely going to help. So Quayla Jovo is from the Flying Lab project and she is the owner of the company actually that has been recruiting young people across the country to teach them about this kind of technology and how it can help in their communities. There wasn't so much adoption of drone technology in South Africa, but then we began to see some people using drone technology for disaster response. So the difference between disaster response and what we are trying to achieve as a company is that by the time you respond, when it's just as a pet, it's a bit late because people have lost their lives, their properties and infrastructure have been destroyed. So we are a thought leader in using drones for disaster preparedness. And we always have plans. So we came here to produce a technology. We partnered with the communities to train and employed youth and we are seeing the results. And it wasn't just experts from outside coming in flying the drones. Part of the project involves young people. Tell me more about that. You know, this group of young people was mainly women, I have to say, young girls, who were actually keen on taking part in learning how to fly drones and even finding out if there are uh, scholarships or bursaries for them to be able to acquire uh, drone licenses so that they are able to take part in this project. I spoke to Gui Pilo Moraga, who actually is from Alexander Township and uh, she's one of the drone operators and she told me what inspired her to take up this project. You may think it looks so easy, it's like playing a video game, no, I'm used to this. Sisters Jones have just been recently regulated in South Africa and they decided to go get my drone license. I was in the first class in South Africa to get a drone license. I'd never seen a drone, I'd never touched a drone, but I was in simulation. So I would just play PlayStation, simulate and just do it on the television or on a computer. So we've trained the ladies here to be the champions of this kind of technology to teach their community members on how to help not only with the flooding but with fires as well because that's in this community to have a hazard because the homes are too close to each other extremely close to each other those shacks and also the flooding homes are flooding homes are washed away and most of the houses are made of shacks but we don't know how many so now we're able to also calculate how many homes will be affected by something that happens like a flood we know how many houses are built from brick we know how many houses are built from corrugated iron and plastic so we know how many families will be affected that way we're able to communicate this with the community the authorities and they know where to fix and how to fix it and you know with, with these kind of exercises i can imagine you know there's lots of kids who have gathered here yeah, as a new school holiday so kids are quite interested i think you are also inspiring the young kids who've gathered around you here today Dude, this is my passion. <laughs> and there they are, literally chasing the drone. <laughs> and that's the drone part. How does the artificial intelligence work? Because that's kind of the newest thing. Well, the AI bit is actually where the magic happens. Because with drone technology and the AI, that's where they put the little maps together. They're able to count how many homes are there in that area they are also able to know how to direct traffic to direct people to safety and also how to uh, direct emergency services officials to go to specific areas where people need help and uh, jack shulubane is actually an ai expert who was there and told me more about the artificial intelligence part of their work it helps us to predict what, what will happen, but that enables the authorities to plan, do mitigation plans in terms of if we were to respond, if we were to, you know, where are the roads big enough, for instance, to allow for emergency personnel to come in, then 
then you can see this good areas that we um, flooded first and then you can move to this point and these are the safe areas that you can use for evacuation. So artificial intelligence becomes important. But the other area where we use artificial intelligence was to look at change detection. You know, we would identify buildings that were altered, buildings that had been demolished, removed, they were not there anymore, and new buildings that were actually coming. One of the things that the AI does is it thinks like thousands of humans were cuts down on the need of having so many people. People would have to be trained, people would be expensive. Do you think it could actually save lives and is a good solution for communities that don't have that much money? Absolutely. I think that it's something that is definitely a good solution for communities that are prone to disasters, particularly poor communities. And the fact that it was young people who lived in that community, one of the drone pilots who lived in that community was the one who was doing the demonstrations and uh, even issuing certificates for teenagers who took part in this project. I think that it's something that will definitely work given the necessary funding. Norms, thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. It's so nice that we got to send you back to Alex for a good news story. I'm absolutely thrilled that I have been able to do this. It's my first time on the climate question and hopefully not the last time. Thank you so much for having me. The South African project is run by Flying Labs, who are a not-for-profit organisation. So it's not yet being rolled out across the country. That would require, as always, more money. While drones and satellites have been used for over a decade, artificial intelligence is still in its infancy. Questions around how reliable and accurate it is more broadly still remain. Dr. Caroline Gevert says there should still always be humans involved in the process. And when it comes to use of drones in her mapping projects, she makes sure locals are at the heart of it. Well, it's very important by building the knowledge that we have, it can really make it available for when it's needed. So you also saw during this project, which was fun, that in the beginning we got in the drones on you, but after that, at one point, there were another lot of drones that was local. So now when there is local people involved, I want to capture images more quickly, so we're in the local knowledge to enable people to collect information more quickly. And also, what I'm driving with our skills, we can be asking different questions at first with the buildings. So, the maps that we need to identify the flood is in the city. They were also given, they were picked out and they were given to community buildings in the city. And then later, we saw that, for example, there was a water outbreak, but then we could use these maps to inform the water. So, a map, even though it's meant for one reason, can be used for many different reasons. So, by giving Local skills, local digital technologies, and then also giving people with more time to interact with them, but also to start using these maps and these technologies to solve other questions that people have in the beginning. Lack of information can cost lives when it comes to flooding, especially in vulnerable communities like informal settlements. Technology like digital mapping, artificial intelligence, and drones were once cutting edge. But as they get cheaper, they can be used to fill in the data gaps, allowing us to see how we can prevent and manage floods in our cities worldwide.
The headquarters of Bangladesh's main opposition party have been raided by police. It follows a third day of violent demonstrations against a quota system for civil service jobs here on Bengi. These are the first significant anti-government protests since Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina won a fourth straight term in January. Earlier on Tuesday, her government ordered all schools, colleges and universities to close indefinitely in response to the unrest that has seen at least six people killed during the clashes between opponents and supporters of the quotas. The protesters are demanding a merit-based system to replace the current allocations. BBC News. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for Monday's attack on a mosque in Oman that killed six people and wounded nearly 30. Three militants also died in the assault. The Sunni Muslim attack on the Shiite mosque took place on Ashura, the day on which Shia Muslims commemorate one of their first demands, but which is frequently a source of sectarian tensions. An Australian computer scientist who falsely claims to have been the creator of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin is facing a criminal investigation in Britain after he was found to have repeatedly lied and forged documents to support his claim. A High Court judge has referred Craig Wright's case to the Crown Prosecution Service to assess potential criminal charges. Yes, Chris Roberts. Since 2016, Dr. Wright has claimed to be the mysterious figure behind a white paper regarding his Bitcoin family pet, published under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. But a number of crypto companies and others jointly launched a case seeking a ruling that he was not Satoshi, accusing him in court of using his claim to pursue legal actions worth hundreds of billions of dollars against private individuals. Mr. Justice Miller believed the evidence against Dr. Wright named Satoshi was overwhelming. The identity of the person or persons who are Satoshi Nakamoto remains unknown. The exiled Chinese businessman Guo Wenhui has been convicted by a U.S. court of stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from online followers. Federal prosecutors said Guo had raised more than a billion dollars, ensuring claimed that backers would not lose money if they joined him in a series of investment in cryptocurrency schemes. He promised that some of the profits would be used to attack the Chinese government. Instead, the money was used to fund a lavish lifestyle. Hello and welcome to Apple, the program bringing you extraordinary stories from around the world. I'm Shane Ross. Today we're going to some Pacific Islands, nearly halfway between Hawaii and New Zealand. The subject of today's program is. Childhood hero, Jan Cruyff, in others. How did that happen? Uh, in 
1978, I played for the Dutch Olympic team. We played the U.S. team. Rinus Migos was our coach. I remember sitting next to him from San Francisco to Kansas City. And we're both looking out of the window, and I'm shaking, and he has not said anything to me. You're shaking because you're scared to be sat next to the boss, right? Absolutely, the general, yeah. And somebody uh, goes, and on the left hand side is the Grand Canyon. And he goes, Thomas, what do you think? I go, I'm almost done with my studies. I'm going to come back to the United States and backpack, but a beautiful country. Fast forward two months later. Thomas, have you signed for the LAS Texas, the head coach? I need a cheap uh, runner that can do all the dirty work. Boy, if I get a thousand dollars a month for you, and you're gonna tell me yes or no? I remember you love the U.S. You don't have to backpack. Uh, I'm giving you a contract for a year. So I thought it was going for, you know, a short amount of time, a long journey. And 45 years later, I'm still here. Still there. What did that feel like getting that phone call? I mean, you know, in your early 20s, I mean, were you signed to a team at that time? Did you know what you were going to be doing career-wise? I could have signed a contract with Ajax, the second team, but since I was not 18, my parents had to sign the contract and they refused. They said, you got to finish your education, which I did. And I hated them for years, but I look back at it now and I'm so glad I've done that. Do you remember when you arrived? In America, do you remember that feeling of arriving? I'm assuming you, you had a suitcase with pretty much everything you had at in your yeah. early 20s. Yeah, pretty amazing when you get there. And the first day in the locker room, I'm actually sitting next to Jordan Cruyff, and there's three Americans that introduce themselves. So, really, think this comes to me, I go, uh, I am Thomas Rogan from Amsterdam, and I'm happy to be here. You know, one of those. <laughs> it was really a pinch me moment. And then Cruyff follows up with, Brilliant, fluent English, pretty much reciting his career in an Alfred World Cup to, to Europa League and going, oh my god, I'm here with the, the maestro, the big timer, my, my hero. Johan Cruyff is a football legend. As a player, they named moves after him the Cruyff Turn, the Cruyff Flick. He imagined and played the game in a totally different way and won almost everything he was to win. I saw him make his debut because my dad was a big Ajax fan and now I'm here sitting next to him in a locker room but preparing for practice in a few weeks. Uh, and yeah, what was he like off the pitch? He was great. Um, he got traded to the Washington Diplomats because the LA franchise didn't have enough money. I saw him get traded as well for Washington Diplomats. I showed up at the airport so it's 1980 a year later. DC and I ended up eventually in Georgetown. I spent five months with the Croy family being their fourth child basically, which was an incredible experience as well. That is incredible. And I guess now is a is a good time, nineteen eighty is a good time to bring in Nikki because that's the year you were born, right? Yes. Yeah. Born in American Samoa. Yeah. Well, um, a very different kind of environment uh, to what Thomas was going through in Washington. Tell me about your upbringing. I was born with uh, my left foot was like upside down. What do you call that? It's like um, deformed. Yeah. Okay. And three months later, my uh, my grandma wants me to come to Samoa. So my mom turned me over to Samoa, and then she start massaging and do whatever she can to make it back to normal. And my whole life grew up in Samoa. I start walking normal when like seven, I think, seven year old. And we have a soccer field in front of our house, so we all, all of us kids who just play soccer there and play rugby. So, uh, and that's how I start playing soccer. And then in 1991, one of my friends is like, let's go to uh, one of our league so we can watch. And we didn't have a soccer team that time, but if there's a village right next to us that have a soccer team. So we went and watched, and then they didn't have a goalkeeper. And I was only 11 that time. But they asked me, and I start, okay, I don't have shoes. So I play goalkeeper with no shoes, no gloves, uh, with a tank top. Did you like it? Do you remember it? I do remember that I saved two penalties. 
to win the game. And then I'm going to start playing book It's a pretty, it's a pretty <laughs> baptism of fire there. Straight in, no shoes, penalties. Yeah, so thank Man, you for asking me. Like, playing in the streets, Nikki grew up not having shoes and becoming a goalkeeper. Pretty amazing how, how worlds are different depending on where you are born and raised. Yeah, different and yet very much the same. Football being that, that kind of unifying force for so many young boys all over the world. But Nikki, I've got to ask you, how did you, as a, as a Samoan, end up choosing football over rugby? So that's how I started. And then they were having a selected team to go to New Zealand for the U12. And I was like, okay, this is going to be good for me. So I went over to a trial and then they, they see me. I was like, oh, this guy can catch anything. Like, you know, jump everywhere. Maybe the way I grew up catching coconut, it was the best thing. So I don't know. <laughs> but um, anyway, I started from there. I went to the living play for the youth ball, and then U15, and then U17, and then I ended up, believe it or not, Thomas Lowe hit me. But I used to play for someone national team. I was playing against um, the American Samoan. Um, we went to Mahiri, I went to Cook Island, I went to Tonga, to Bakode, Kini. That might sound a bit odd that Nicky could play for the country next door, but as he says, his grandparents lived in Samoa, and that's where he grew up. There are deep familial and cultural links between Samoa and American Samoa, so it's not uncommon for people to move fluidly from one country to the other, like Nicky did. The Samoan Islands only became separate countries in 1899 when, as the name suggests, the American government struck a deal with the Germans, who counted these islands as part of their territory. Of Polynesian culture combined with free movement and a lack of formal borders all plays into the next part of our story. How Nikki, at the tender age of 20, ended up being the oldest and most experienced player in the American Samoan squad when they faced Australia in that ill fated match back in 2001. Tell me about the, uh, the infamous game, because obviously I'd, I'd heard your name even before. I knew I was going to interview 